As one of Germany's top airports and one of the 20 largest in Europe, Dusseldorf Airport is as busy as it can be. It is early afternoon of April 11, 1996, and as usual, the arrivals are pouring in. The first level of Terminal A is swarming with passengers. While some wait for their luggage, others rush to departure gates to catch the next flight. Hundreds of people are in motion. They are unaware that hidden just 10 feet above them, a disaster is unfolding. A taxi driver is on the scene, waiting for customers. In a crowded terminal, he is the first to notice something suspicious. Sparks are falling from the dropped ceiling in the arrivals area. The time is 3.33 p.m., and two firefighters of the airport fire department arrive at the scene. There's a particular odor in the air, but they cannot locate its source. It's as if an electrical installation is smoldering. From the nearby flower shop, a saleswoman points to a thin column of smoke coming from the vent. It's a fire. Suddenly, the ceiling begins to glow, and burning embers start falling. There's no time to waste, and the firefighters on site alert the entire airport fire brigade. Within minutes, dozens of firefighters arrive. They bring everything they have with them, but the fire is nowhere to be seen. It's hidden above the dropped tiles. Then, at 3.58 p.m., the blaze reveals itself in full force. The ceiling throughout the entire terminal engulfs in flames. The airport is on fire, and it's a massive one. On that fateful afternoon, welders worked on an expansion joint on the elevated access road above Terminal A. The workers started welding at 1 p.m., blissfully unaware of the dangers they were creating. Tiny droplets of molten metal were falling onto the top layer of the terminal. Between the ceiling and the road was a layer of polystyrene insulation that was highly combustible. For more than two hours, the insulation was heating up to the level of flashover. Gases released by the slow combustion of polystyrene filled a confined space above the ceiling. When the temperature of these gases reached its peak, they ignited simultaneously throughout the entire terminal. In a split second, a massive fire engulfed the entire ceiling. Paradoxically, the airport firefighters knew nothing about handling indoor fires. They were trained to put out plane fires. The Dusseldorf Fire Brigade was then called to help and arrived at the airport at 4.07 p.m. At that point, the fire had spread to the terminal's second level. A blaze of such proportions was simply too much for the two fire trucks and one water tanker to handle. Eight minutes later, the commanding officer on scene called all city units and neighboring municipalities to respond immediately. The Dusseldorf City Fire Brigade comprises paid and volunteer firefighters stationed in seven full-time and ten volunteer stations. 120 permanent firefighters and 250 volunteers staff each shift. Along with firefighters from the airport and nearby municipalities, 701 firefighters and 215 vehicles were on the scene to extinguish the blaze and save the people inside. The Dusseldorf firefighters hadn't experienced a fire of this size for a long time. One of them recollected using a hose pumping 50 gallons of water per minute with no success. Only after switching to a four times larger hose did they begin to suppress the fire. The moment when the city fire brigade was called to help at 4.07, the airport alarm system instructed travelers to evacuate the building. The voice message initially pointed people in the wrong direction, straight toward the burning section. Thankfully, the firefighters intervened in time to correct the mistake and prevent a fatal outcome. By the time the general alarm went off, level one of the terminal had already been evacuated. However, there were still more than 2,000 people on levels 2, 3, 4, and 5, as well as in the adjacent garage. They had little time to evacuate as the blaze rapidly spread. The fire engulfed the terminal's entire inventory on level 1, including heavy rubber conveyor belts that produced a thick, hazardous smoke. Smoke and fire traveled through staircases, escalator openings, and cable and air ducts in the ceiling to level 2. The second level was 30 feet tall, twice as high as the first, but had a smaller surface area. Inside it was a mezzanine level 3 with airport lounges. Both floors quickly filled with smoke. While a group of firemen fought the fire on level 1, their colleagues were engaged in rescuing the people on higher floors. Teams of paramedics gathered in the front of the airport to treat the injured, most of which suffered from breathing problems. 
Thick smoke and high temperatures made it difficult for firefighters to locate people inside the terminal. In one case, nine passengers were trapped in Air France's airport lounge. It was a self-service salon, with no staff present to guide occupants to safety. Multiple phone calls were made from the lounge, the last one at 419. Although one of the callers described their location, no one among the rescuers was familiar with the terminal layout. Being only 25 feet from the nearest escape route, all but one occupant died from suffocation. To escape, a French businessman smashed a window with a chair and fell four meters to the lower level. He suffered serious injuries, but fully recovered. Another group of people were on the roof of the adjacent car garage when the fire broke out. They were watching planes take off and land. As soon as they noticed smoke coming from the terminal below them, they ran out to the exit. Unfortunately, they made the wrong choice by escaping from the roof via elevators. The elevators opened into the first level, which was a light. Due to the thick smoke that filled the hall, the sensors were jammed and the door remained open. They too died of suffocation. There were also three police officers trapped inside the terminal who were more fortunate. When they realized the fire surrounded them, they radioed their colleague in his office. Ernst G. Walter rushed inside the terminal to save the three, but was repelled by thick, toxic smoke. To escape the burning airport, the policemen tried everything in their power. With a pickaxe, they tried to break a window, but were unsuccessful. There wasn't much they could do. At the last moment, a group of firefighters wearing protective smoke gear appeared at the door. They found the three policemen lying on the floor, still breathing. Then, through the smoke and flames, they were all taken to safety. For nearly four hours, firefighters battled to put out the fire. Finally, at 7.20 p.m., the fire brigade declared it under control. The last pockets of the blaze were extinguished two hours later. The fire and smoke destroyed terminals A and B. Dusseldorf Airport reopened three and a half days later, with only Terminal C functioning. It quickly returned to 90% of its previous capacity using temporary terminals made of tents and hangars. In the end, 17 people lost their lives in the fire. Eight of them died in the lounge, seven in the elevators, a passenger was found dead in the lavatory, and a woman who escaped the airport died two weeks later from her injuries. All victims died from suffocation or smoke inhalation. If it weren't for the brave reaction of the firefighters, the death toll would have been much higher. Approximately 2,000 passengers were saved from the fire. About 66 to 82 had serious injuries, and several hundred suffered minor injuries. The deaths of 17 people, hundreds of injuries, and damage of a billion German marks, which was more than 600 million US dollars at the time, called for a thorough investigation. There was no doubt that droplets of molten metal that fell on the insulation caused the fire. A three-inch thick layer of highly flammable polystyrene insulation was installed illegally below the concrete deck of the access road. Between it and the arrival hall suspended ceiling, there was nothing but an unprotected void. The insulation layer was too close to the upper deck and exposed to hot metal from the welding. The droplets burned the polystyrene insulation, which created a massive amount of gases and increased the temperature in the void. 
At one point, the temperature reached the critical point and ignited 1,000 square feet of the ceiling. From there, the fire spread to the rest of the terminal. However, apart from the issue with the insulation, the Investigation Commission determined that a number of other factors contributed to the fire and turned it into a tragedy. The first was the failure of workers performing welding operations on the road above Level 1 to take appropriate precautions. Their employer did not inform the airport fire brigade about the repair works. If they had been notified as required, the fire brigade would have set up a fire watch. On the other hand, the airport fire brigade was unprepared and untrained for indoor fire scenarios, and their knowledge of the airport layout was inadequate. Perhaps the most crucial factor was the airport's lack of an appropriate fire detection system. The east end of the building, where Terminal A was located, had no smoke detectors or sprinklers. This part of the airport was built in 1972 when such systems were not mandatory. There were dry standpipes in the stairwells, but these were not connected to the municipal water supply and had to be operated by firefighters. Additionally, the terminal had no roll-down fire doors, no protection for vertical openings between floors, and no emergency exit stairwells on the air side. The fire could have been contained at level 1 if roll doors and vertical protections were available. There was also a responsibility on the part of the airport security officials, who failed to turn off the elevators once the fire started. Seven people were killed as a result of this negligence. By the end of the year, a court trial was opened. The public prosecutor's office filed a 700-page indictment against two welders, the technical director of the airport, the architect, and the building inspectors and supervisors. A mammoth trial with 26 defense attorneys, 94 witnesses, and an army of press representatives promised that the justice would be fulfilled. However, it turned into a long game of formal legal dodgings. Surprisingly, the trial was concluded five and a half years later, with all defendants acquitted. According to the verdict, the accident that claimed 17 lives could not be traced to any specific wrongdoing of a single defendant. The airport authorities, however, were determined not to repeat the mistakes from the past. As a result, the renewed Terminal A and newly built Terminal B are equipped with fire detectors, sprinklers, automatic fire alarms, fire reporting, and smoke clearing systems. In addition, 36 security exits were made and dividers were installed within and between levels to slow down the spread of fire and smoke. Most importantly, the insulation panels, the furniture, and the inventory are made from non-combustible materials. Indeed, there was a strong wish for tragedies like 1996 to never happen again. When it comes to people's lives, there's no safety procedure that can't be followed and no price that can't be paid. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.